Um, <clears throat> hi. So, hi, Cerise. Um, do I call you Miss Howard? I don't know. I'm still new to this whole uni thing. Um, thanks for teaching the class. There's not much else to say. Um, I am doing this at like 6am because that's the only time I function these days. And I wrote the entire thing this morning and I accidentally wrote like 900 words. So this is going to be way longer than it needs to be. So to get that out of the way, I'm just going to say here are my top five. Um, and I'm going to give you really brief explanation as to why I'm still going to do the whole rant through because I want to, uh, and it's 6.24 AM and you can't stop me. So my top five, are the story of the Kelly gang, because it reflects how weird early cinema was, um, how amateurish, how cheap, and how decentralized it was, the birth of a nation, because it codified film grammar and represents the sheer ability for evil in film and the massive amount and the massive impact of film as propaganda over its history. After that I've got Star Wars, um, mostly because it popularized the hero's journey model and that has reverberated throughout film history. It also had incredibly influential sound design and just everything about it. Um, after that, Terminator 2, because it broke how we understand the world and how we understand just general film form, because it changed how we relate to actors and CGI and effects. Um, finally, Me at the Zoo, because it represents the start of the YouTube era, the total polarization of film production into both extremely high-budget Hollywood productions and extremely low-budget amateur online productions. Um, with that out of the way, I'm going to do the whole thing. I've actually already used up my entire time. Uh, from here on out, you don't have to watch this. But I'm still gonna do it. Film history is a nebulous thing. With its portable and universal manufacturing process, it has always been a very international medium. As such, its development has followed many parallel paths. That is one reason why it's so reason to mark so that is one reason why it's so difficult to mark out a canon in film history. What is groundbreaking in one place may be forgotten in another. What defines one genre may be irrelevant in others. The centralization and industrialization of Hollywood has helped to narrow things somewhat, but only discussion of but any discussion of the Hollywood landmarks is inherently reductive. As such, this lifts is my attempt to highlight important moments, films that challenge and shifted to some extent the popular understanding of film form, be it ordered chronologically. The Story of the Kelly Gang is the first feature film. Produced in 1906, right here in Melbourne, Australia, this film is emblematic of the whole nature of early film production. Its creators were two theatre directors, working un under conditions not unlike most student filmmakers. They employed friends and family in all roles, they, and worked off of a minuscule budget. They borrowed props and sets from any available source. Indeed, the film was likely produced without a script, with likely director Charles Tate running mostly off of his own memory of Ned Kelly's somewhat recent crime spree. Its location, as well, is emblematic of Philippa, darling, puppy dog. Its location, as well, is emblematic of the nature of early film. Melbourne was a hub of early cinema, indeed hosting one of the world's first film studios in the Salvation Army's limelight department. This boom was not to last, however, as the Australian film industry was largely destroyed under moralistic pretenses. Within ten years, most states had banned the production of bushranger films, and a new administration of the Salvation Army had disbanded their burgeoning film empire. It could have gone differently, but within twenty years, Australian film was all but extinct.
my other dog is snoring now. D.W. Griffiths is an icon, a visionary, and an abhorrent stain on the history of film. His magnum opus, For Birth of a Nation, takes every idea, every advancement, every innovation in the film form, and uses it for nothing less than pure evil. This film codified the grammar and vocabulary of the filmic language. It popularized the use of close-ups, panning, and tracking shots. It also popularized the lost cause mythology. From fades to staging to scoring to structure to all factors and moments of construction, all modern filmmakers owe a debt to the birth of a nation. You owe a debt to the birth of a nation. And while I wouldn't say it infects its descendants, it certainly coloured the attitudes of the American film industry. It didn't have to be this way. It could have gone differently. But we would do well to remember the evil at the birth of the medium. From here I'm going to stop with the kind of sad what-if markers, because from here on out the points I'm marking aren't tragic, at least not to the same extent as early film. Star Wars is absolutely iconic in so many ways. This film redefines so much, not only in how we produce film, but in how we teach it, and how we understand directors to relate to their finished works. The shadow of this film is a long one, from its later influence on how we in produce and understand film franchises, to its revolutionary sound design for the formation of the indescribably influential industrial light and magic. George Lucas, it also changed how we influence, yeah, it also changed how we understand narratives. George Lucas was a fan, if not a disciple, of one Joseph Campbell, and his seminal work, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. This book proposed the theory of the so-called monomyth, although more know it as the hero's journey, a 12 to 17 point story that Lucas adopted wholesale to form the story of Luke Skywalker. This story structure has since been endorsed by damn near every film, cinema, story, and writing class I have ever been to. It's all George Lucas's fault, and no, I am not okay. There's a common, if not disgust, understanding between the audience and the filmmaker. Most audiences, cinephile or not, have an understanding of what techniques are available in production. Going back to high school, that's the camels, your camera, acting, lighting, mise-en-scene, and effects and sound. T2 took that understanding and tore it to shreds. Before this film, there was an implicit understanding on what actors, what an actor could and could not do. One of the most essential was that actors have to obey the laws of the physical human body. Sure, practical effects and trickery could do all manner of things to a person, but outside the realm of animation, they were fairly limited tools. Then Robert Patrick fucking melted and we entered the age of CGI. In terms of the construction of this list, I found through searching that I largely agreed with Roger Ebert's 1999 list of the greatest films of the 20th century. It was, like this one, in chronological order, and it ended, like this one, with a small, independent film. He predicted that the 21st century would be one of formal polarization, an increasing dichotomy between popular, extremely low-budget, independent filmmaking and extremely high-budget studio blockbusters. His example was the Blair Witch Project, but mine is me at the zoo. It's a budget order. It's a budget order of magnitude slower than any independent horror, and its legacy looms just as, if not larger. This is the first YouTube video, and the first in the dawn of a new age for film. So that's my top five. You can leave your list in the comments. Uh, don't forget to like, subscribe, and ding that little bell. Okay, bye. Fucking hell, this is shit.